I wrote this lecture as a part of the course HNR 340, Making and the Maid, which is offered through the Rene Crown Honors Program at Syracuse University. This lecture is presented in three parts as three separate videos on YouTube. At the end of part one, there will be a link for part two, and at the end of part two, there will be a link for part three. We're talking in these videos about plywood as a material, but more importantly, we're talking about plywood as a cultural indicator. For the purposes of this video, I'm defining plywood as thin sheets of wood that are glued together with their grains rotated 90 degrees from each other. The use of plywood goes back a very long time, at least as early as 1000 BCE, although very likely farther than that. We know that people have been conscious for quite a while of the fact that when you orient the grain on pieces of wood in this way and glue them together, it makes for a stronger wood product than a simple plank of wood. We see veneer, that is to say, very thin sheets of wood, used all the way through the Middle Ages and into the Renaissance and later. We even see thin sheets of wood glued in a cross-grain condition throughout furniture history, but we don't see real mass production of plywood until the 19th century. This box, from the 10th century BCE in Egypt, is made out of a sort of homemade plywood and then painted. Here we can see an image on the top of an early 20th century plywood factory. A log is held between two points and rotated against a long and very sharp knife. That knife peels off a very thin sheet of wood from the log. It's about a 32nd of an inch thick, or about the same thickness as the cardboard in your average cereal box. This very long, thin sheet is then cut into smaller sheets of veneer, as you can see on the bottom image. The top left image in this slide shows a typical sandwich of five veneers of wood that are being stacked with the grain 90 degrees from each other. Why would we do this? Why does that make it stronger? Well, the answer is that wood is very, very strong across the grain, but tends to be weak with the grain. That's why, for example, when you split firewood, if you try to cut across the section of the tree, it's very hard to do. But if you cut down the length of the tree, your splitting mall goes right through it. This is also why yeah, martial arts experts try to punch a piece of wood in such a way that it will split down the grain. Even Bruce Lee could not split wood across the grain with his bare hand. So, when we oppose the grains, we impart a great deal of strength to the material. The grain on one layer runs in one direction, and the grain on the next layer runs 90 degrees to that. The next layer is 90 degrees to that one, and so on up through the sandwich. We always have an odd number of sheets. In construction grade material, such as you see on the bottom left, that odd number of sheets is usually either three, five, or seven. In furniture grade material, seen on the bottom right, there can be as many as 13 or even 15 layers in a piece of plywood. Then that sandwich of wood veneer and adhesive is placed into what's called a press. The top right image on this slide shows the plywood press. Those two workers are sliding the plywood into individual platens. The veneer sandwiches will be compressed under a great deal of pressure and heat for a certain period of time and then taken out and trimmed to size. So what do we use this for? Well, on this slide you can see on the top left naked floor joists. For a very long time, when one wanted to lay a floor, one would start with these joists which are tied to the building structure. Then carpenters would lay pine planks diagonally across them, nailing into every joist. On top of that, well, then you would lay whatever oak or heart pine or maple flooring you wanted. You can see in the bottom image that this is also how we would sheath houses. The studs stand vertically, and then we would run hundreds and hundreds of pine planks at 45 degree angles nailed into every single stud. Then we'd put on the clapboards or whatever siding was going on the outside of the house. Now this has the advantage of making a very strong diagonally braced house, both horizontally and vertically. It has the disadvantage of requiring a massive number of pine planks and a gr very great number of steel nails. In 1900, the average size of the American house for a family of four was 900 square feet. Doesn't seem very big, does it? The average dorm room in an American college is about 130 square feet, so we're talking about maybe seven dorm rooms total making up a house for a family of four. You can see in this chart that there's been a precipitous rise in the amount of square footage for an average house for a family for in America with a short drop when the big banks lied to us all and caused the financial crisis in our country. In the year 2010, the average size of a house for a family of four in America was 2,500 square feet. 
two and a half times the size it had been just a century earlier. It's a massive change in the way we live. Why did that happen? In part, it happened because of this. What is this? Well, we'll talk about that in the next video. Click on the link for Plywood in Context Part 2, in which I'll get into the military industrial complex and how that played a direct role in this explosion of the average size of an American home.